We're going to do things quite a bit different this morning, which will be a real opportunity for you to do something you haven't done before in regard to everything we've talked about. This is going to be what we might call a, a workshop session, where you do a lot of work. And if you're if you're bashful at all about speaking up, for heaven's sake, speak up. Go against any shyness. Maybe you don't have any. I don't know. That's up to you to decide. But speak up and say something, which I'll explain about what to say in a minute. Go against it. You have no feeling at all that you might be saying something stupid or embarrassing or anything like that. Just speak up and contribute to it. Now, what we're going to do is everyone, this is voluntarily. No one is forced to do anything you don't want to do. You're going to speak out and contribute something to the group as a whole, anything you want that is a contribution to what we're trying to get at in these groups. You might mention some little experience you had where you learned something in a practical way that you'd learned by the letter, by a book, or by listening to the talk. Or some truth, some idea that suddenly became clearer to you, or that you ran onto for the first time. There are no rules at all except Offer something that will contribute. And you can go on as long as you want, up until a reasonable time. Because I want everyone who wants to volunteer to say something. Then others can comment on that comment if they want. You may want to ask a question of someone. And I will. you will see how things go as we go along. So it's a little bit different. You're going to talk yourself. And you're going to be observing yourself as you talk to see if you are a little bit nervous. Or you maybe you're afraid that you said something that was incorrect. Just see this, that's all. Now, you've never done this much before, except a little bit, in a small way. So now's your chance to do something different. And what we're trying to do is break the pattern, perhaps, of just sitting back and listening to someone talk. That's so easy, and it has its place. But now you have to get out and expose yourself and maybe see that you're not as confident as you thought you were. Or maybe you'll say you'll ask a question that you were uh, hesitant to ask before because you would show that you didn't know as much as maybe you thought you did. See? So, this is what the whole meeting is going to consist of, both halves. And to start it off, Sally is going to offer something constructive. Uh, I have noticed how easily I become distracted with things. Uh, I can become distracted in the apartment or in the home, say, uh, just with a piece of furniture or an ornament that someone may have given me as a gift. My thoughts are taken away from me to the person who has given it to me, and this gives me a nice, comfortable feeling. And of course, this can happen with anything we do. We're distracted even in trying to give people the truth. We try to force it on them, see, and this is a distraction from ourselves. And recently I had a work project, I'm still doing it, that each, the first, as soon as I step into the office, first thing in the morning and first thing in the afternoon after lunch, I have to remember this first step in. And I've noticed I can remember it say up to a minute or two beforehand and then I'm distracted. Somebody maybe talks to me or my thoughts take me over. So uh, just li this little one work project of stepping into the office is very difficult to try and remember that this is, this is what you're doing and this is where you are at this particular moment and uh, this is just one of distraction. Uh, taking Letting things take you away from where you are at the moment. All right. Go, go ahead. Well, I just noticed just now, <laughs> while she was talking about distraction, I was thinking about, you know, you put a pressure on me because you said you have to talk. So my mind was half on what Sally was saying and half on what am I going to say. Right, uh -huh. right, right, right. So you were divided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, someone else, besides who has spoken already, tell me, why on earth is Sally doing what she's doing? What is it, a game? Why is she doing this? What's the purpose? Don't forget our purpose, our aim. Why is she doing it? What? The purpose is to wake up, to become more, more aware. 
to become one, to, to become, to really become your true self. In other words, you want to go against your mechanicalness. And right. Yeah, break mechanicalness. I want to see what I am right now, not where my thoughts are, maybe in Scotland, for instance, or any place at all, maybe enjoying myself rather than being in the office. Uh, I want to see where I am. And this right. work project, if we give ourselves all these little work projects, we're interrupting our mechanicalness. And we're trying to break it so that we know this is where I am right now. In other words, you began to see that you <coughs> need a lot of work to do with yourself. Right. Your and mind you, is always wandering mm -hmm, around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see how you think you can do a lot of things. And you find out that you can't, you forget. You really do a simple thing like that. You're forgotten. See how this confirms a principle we've talked about many times. You have to see how little you can do, how lost you are. person thinks, well, I'm in control of my mind. He hasn't the slightest notion of how he's absent from himself 24 hours a day, living in daydreams, pleasant daydreams or negative daydreams. This little project that she's practicing to see that many times, at the beginning at least, she can't even remember that she's going to be aware of herself crossing the threshold, the doorway, into her office in the morning. And so she says, five minutes before she is to do it, she says, okay, I'm going to be aware of myself stepping into the office. And she walks in, and an hour later, I didn't even remember that. See how shocking this that we can't even do the simplest of things? All right, that is the first step toward doing it. Now she's doing it more. And it helps break down all this phoniness that I can do this, I can do right. whatever I want to. Right. See that you it's have no command at all. Because right. you're, why? Because you're, the prodigal son is wandering away out in the wilderness, isn't it? We're bringing the prodigal son back home where he belongs so that our minds is right where our body is all the time. Speaking of the uh, mind wandering, I <coughs> thought that was very excellent that you gave us yesterday. Just the two little simple words, drop it. Because my mind wandered so much yesterday that I must have used drop it a hundred times. And not only did I use it, but I had to use it severely a couple of times. I had to really work at emphasize it. Yeah. Drop it. Yeah. Because it was wandering in such a beautiful daydream right, right. that I didn't want to, I didn't want to come back to reality or to wake up, as you say. We have to give up these pleasures of daydreams if we're going to wake up. And we don't want to do it. The old nature doesn't want to do it. It's much more beautiful to dream of what? Of the new home that you hope to get someday Guess or... Guess who the hero is. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Guess who the hero is. Yes, yes, yes. So we have to go against what our mechanical nature wants to do and bring ourselves back to now, which is always a shock. And that shock is a principle too, is it not? There's no work without one, the shock, two, using the shock properly. We're shocked all day long when you don't don't applaud me or someone doesn't compliment. That's the shock. A thousand times. We didn't get the parking place down at the store we wanted. Now we have to go around the block again. A shock. If we use that properly, we would be free of it eventually. Juan will now add something. Okay. I will bring the subject of resistance to some of this truthful or true principles that Mr. Howard speaks about to us over and over again. We must observe that we resist it. We're not letting it come in. But sometimes we deceive ourselves that we like it. So we must become aware of our own resistance. That we resist in some of this principle. And the next thing I know, I might use something else to blame it on. It might be my husband, my boyfriend, or little kid, you know, son. Because I have noticed this myself. I resist a lot of things, he says. I won't let him come in. But I deceive myself that I'm really working and, you know, I really like it. But the first thing we've got to see is that we're against this. There's a lot of resistance in us. 
and we have to go against the resistance, or at least become aware that it's there. Uh, if, they, if, if there's a certain truth that he'll say, and i say later, you know, I like it. Well, I didn't like it. But I'm deceiving myself that I did like what he said. So right now, I'm exposing myself. Are you watching it? Are you aware of it? Because well, he doesn't like it. I don't find that I resist what Mr. Howard is saying. I, I just find that I resist or I resent when I have to relate to that experience outside. I can't, I have to bring myself back to what I learned in the class where I didn't resist it when you said it. I resent it when I'm faced with the uh, situation on the outside mm -hmm. and that's where resistance would come in for me. Whereas in a practical situation, yeah. you, for example, have to give up the need to answer someone real quick that's because right. maybe yes. they made you tense and so you... Yes, right. yes, I understand. Yes. That's very good. Because the mind, the first thing we'll do is blame him you know, for saying it. But it's actually, we're angry at ourselves. When you become aware that you know, you're going to use it on somebody else. But uh, this is the way that I have been conditioned in many, many ways. That I know, I'm real smart. This, yeah, this this is the way I was conditioned. In. And uh, if you try to tell me what is right, I'm going to contradict you. So I have to go against all this. Right. I'm going to be a nobody. <laughs> and this is painful. It's not that easy now. No. You have to give up that image. Yeah. Of uh, being someone who knows the answers, sure. for example. Maybe. If I interrupt just a minute. Maybe on the everyday level, you do know a lot of answers. What what your business is? Maybe you're in say the the uh, automobile parts business or whatever it might be. You may have tremendous knowledge, and that is okay on its own level. Otherwise, you couldn't get a spare part for your car. But if you identify with it, this is what I'm saying, and become proud of it, and take every opportunity to tell everyone you can. Well, I'm the manager of the car parts department. That's another thing, right? Now we've got an eye, we've got vanity in it. So if we can see the two separate. Areas there were all right. Yeah, because it can be done also separately. I enjoy, you know, that I'm pretty smart. In other words, brag to myself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is hard to break, but it can be done. I mean, it's painful. But how can it be done? Can anyone, anyone here tell me? How can we start? How can we start? Um, oh, yeah. On breaking uh, some of this. Um, for instance, I'm speaking about being smart. Mm -hmm. An image of being smart. Okay. First okay. steps. First step is to see that you have it. <laughs> yeah, That's sure. The sure. Then you can drop then it. Then you drop it. Humiliation comes in there, which she was bringing yesterday. You drop a book, don't look around and see who's looking at you. Don't be humiliated. Don't pick it up. Don't say anything. Observe yourself on the way and put it up. Or somebody sees you do something else that is really stupid. Do not apologize or do anything. You just serve it. So the first thing I do is smile and say, I'm sorry, I did that. Or, and then watch it. How much resistance is there? We don't want to do it. Right, Bob? You do understand, I'm sure, that you're out in a crowd and you accidentally bump someone, you say, I'm sorry, right. that is not is right. what we're talking about. That's that common courtesy is, is just I'm fine. Sorry. That's fine. I would like someone to ask Sally a question, which she will answer. Ask Sally a question. Any question? Sally, I think you have the trouble, I do too, that it seems as if other people distract you. Mm -hmm. That is, your response to other people is the distraction. What can you do about that? My response to other people. Make sure you understand the question clearly uh -huh. before you go on. Ask her to repeat it if you don't understand. Uh, actually, I don't really understand it. 
or say it in a different way. Say that, uh, you're intent on keeping your awareness of, of, of watching yourself at the moment. But then someone else appears. Isn't that almost automatically a distraction? And have you overcome that, and how do you do it? <laughs> well, when someone else appears, shouldn't my attention, I mean, I can watch myself to a certain extent, but yet my attention is on the other person. Mm-hmm. At that particular time, if you just talk to me, I can only be aware of myself to a certain extent because I'm my attention is now on you. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, now listen, just a minute. Don't forget the law of alternation. Mm-hmm. Start with a basic one. First of all. You're in thought some of the time. Some of the time you are not in thought. You're simply seeing everything. This this is good. Now follow. When your attention, she asked you a question. You may have to go into thought. She asked you how to get from here to uh, Sunset Boulevard. You have to go into thought at that moment to say, well, you go 10 miles here and 10 miles there. But it's 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 like lightning. A second later... When that thought has been completed because you've answered a question, then you can simply go back to a simple awareness of the whole situation. You cannot be in awareness all the time. You cannot, you should not be in thought all the time. Most people are because they know nothing else. So there would be a very swift alternating between that. It goes so fast you'll never see it, but you begin to see it. That, this is the whole answer to that. If you remember that you must alternate between thought and simply seeing something, that will answer the question. Did someone else want to... Go ahead. Uh, no, so at the time you ask me a question, my attention is on you. And answering the question in thought, and then it immediately, then it can switch back, alternate to being aware of myself. Uh-huh. Yeah. See? Excuse me, go ahead. Uh, let me say one thing, please. See, in this, when when both of you are right in this talking back and forth, asking questions or whatever, there's no negativity at, at all as long as you're doing it properly, right? There's no need to get negative at all. Because the thought that she is using is not negative thought. It is conditioned thought in the sense that you have to think, well, Sunset Boulevard is west instead of east. Therefore, it's conditioned on the social level. But that is not negative. Sunset Boulevard happens to be that way. But there's no negativity there at all. Negativity would be, why does she want to go to Sunset Boulevard? Uh, she's heard about the specials that are on sale there, and she'll get them before I do. See the difference? Unnecessary. Yes. She's added something to it, as Juan brought out one time. Can you begin to see where thought, instead of simply being a practical thing, begins to get self-reference. Why did he ask that? What is, what is he trying to get? Go ahead. Well, I don't know if it's clear, but I, um, like someone can come in, and you can get involved in a conversation two hours and completely lose yourself in the conversation and then remember that you've been unaware. And there's a certain amount of guilt that comes with that. All right. You tell us why. You you mean you're sitting and just sort of blabbing for a couple hours with someone? All right. And completely unaware. Not conscious at all, really. And you have guilt about it afterward? And then when you finally remember that you've been lost for two or three hours. Guilt is a wrong reaction. Why don't you just see many things? Why don't you just see, to, just to begin with, how you wasted all this energy trading nonsensical talk with someone else, wasting all this energy that you could have been used, could have been used for better things. But guilt is always a wrong reaction in any case whatsoever. We discussed that so thoroughly yesterday, I don't think we have to bring it up again. Then, as you were to see that you did waste your time, you're not going to keep doing that. You're going to cut it down to maybe an hour and 50 minutes tomorrow because you haven't shattered it enough. The, the light is just beginning to dawn. Then the next week it might be an hour and a half. Pretty soon you're not going to waste your time. Or you, you just can't do that anymore. You can't live that way anymore. We wasted enough time. Let's, let's knock off the nonsense and get to work, which does not mean you don't have social occasions. We have them here. But while I ho- should hope that while we're having tea, that we're wide awake while we're doing so. Look, one world. You should be in a state 
of mind, to use the word generally mind, where there's no difference between us talking here and just talking informally after the meeting. Why do you divide it into now we're going to be spiritual and now we're going to have tea? Tea is just as spiritual as anything else. Why do you divide going going to the office any different from coming here? It's simply a word, a label that has made it different. There's no difference. The We're at work 24 hours a day. This is simply a special session where we remind ourselves of this, where we're here, here to help each other. Who will say something? Who will offer something? Bob? Shall we ask Sally questions? Ask Sally another question. <laughs> Why, Sally, is when we have to, what we feel is an emotional elation, and we're on top, we're looking forward to something with extreme excitement. Why is there always the the, the opposite, the, uh, the pain for it, the, uh, uh, the pain later on? Well, this is really cause and effect. It's opposites, Bob. Uh, where you're looking forward to something, this is a wrong psychological. It's really a negative thought. We're looking forward to something, right? And we make ourselves happy with all this anticipation. And this, of course, is wrong. Where there's a, um, a psychological up, there has to be a psychological down. It's the, Law of opposites, right. cause and effect. And we're taking ourselves away from ourselves again when we need this anticipation. Right. We're living in illusion. We're not with ourselves when we're thinking about this, are we, Bob? Apparently not. We're not. It's giving us this lovely false glow of what's going to happen, and if it doesn't happen, then we're... We slide down to the opposite. <coughs> if we don't get what we anticipate, we're on the downward trend. That's when the gloom comes in and the depression. Is it not? It must. If, if one follows the other. Right. So we have to... Of course, uh, Miss Sally, uh, wherever there's a thrill, excitement, mm-hmm. happiness, you know, the condition type, mm-hmm. the one we beautiful woman or handsome man. I must start observing that that one takes me all the way, all the time, right. to the opposite, mm-hmm. the pendulum. Mm-hmm. From bitterness to happiness, mm-hmm. back and forth. Mm-hmm. Right. Where we have one, we must have the other. And remember, there's an I in both, right? Uh-huh. And they're both false eyes. I am happy because tomorrow night I'm going to be honored as the salesman of the year. And I'm going to, the banquet is in my honor. I am great. This gives me a false feeling of self, right? Then, oh, what? Two days later, it's over. I've got the medal. I've got the honor. And I'm sitting home. I'm depressed. Why? Because that I that seemed to be confirmed by this exterior thing is no longer being charged. It's not giving the shot of alcohol, so to speak, psychological alcohol. So now I'm depressed because my I, which was false when it was up there, now doesn't feel affirmed. Now I don't know who I am. I, I was the most successful salesman of the year for about an hour. Then the party always goes over, doesn't it? The party always ends. This is very so important. it's the I. Excuse me. Well, go ahead. This is very important because life seems to go in these cycles, or the false life that we cling to, oh. we want to cling to, before we can drop that false self. Drop it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think those things happen because you live in constant thought. It couldn't happen otherwise because you have to experience the pleasure and you want to keep it to repeating it, repeating right. it, repeating it. So this is thought that's bringing it back. So the main thing is, like like Sally said, you have to drop it as soon as you see it. Otherwise, all those eyes are taking you over. I mean, you know, that's what we're trying to get rid of. <laughs> I think you were had your hand up. Yes, well, uh, I was going to change it over a little bit uh, and uh, from my own observation of being in the classes and everything I was thinking yesterday we've seen many people come into the class and then we didn't see them again or we've seen them for a while and they didn't show up after that and I I was just thinking about it yesterday and then a thought came to me uh, that uh, after a while you have to realize you know like after being in the class and after studying this, uh, you get many tests, 
I have. And you realize that if you're not really working, that if this isn't play, and if you're not really working, that you can't stay here. You can't be here. Because you can't fool yourself after a while. And I thought, well, that's probably why we don't see some of these people back. Because when they realize that they're only going to get what they're going to put into it. And this is what came to me yesterday. Yeah, that's very good observation. And I'm sure that many of you, maybe unconsciously, have come here and said, well, there's, where's the man who was there last week? He seemed so interested and he commented. And this man is going to really come and learn something. And that man goes away forever. You watch your reaction when you do that. You have to be at the point where you you don't care whether there's a class or not. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Because you yourself are your own class. And if no one else on God's earth wants to learn this, you can learn by yourself at home all alone. Don't you depend on numbers in this. First place, you can see that can never be a mass movement. Never. And if you see a room full one day and two the next, that, that's meaningless. This means that you're still depending on other people to confirm that this is right. You have to know from yourself, and you will eventually. You, you suspect it now. You may not have it fully. Don't you depend on me or anyone else. And you don't need to, because when you are one with yourself, there is nothing outside of that. God does not he, need help. He doesn't need you or I to confirm the rightness of this, or truth, or reality. Use the term you want. But this is all part of our work. As you said, there are many challenges. You come and there's a little disappointment. And, and you can't figure it out why he was so excited. And he said, this is the greatest talk I've heard in years. I'm giving up my psychiatrist because of you. That's the last you see of him. He was deceiving himself in making this all this affirmation that it was great and all that. But he didn't know it. You understand? He really didn't know it. Which is why when someone comes here and goes... That's the end. They're, that's the end. They never sent notices or anything like that. That would be wrong. That would be trying to encourage them on a level because maybe we wanted them back in order to give us encouragement. We don't lift a finger. We state the truth. Each of us, that's it. We, there's nothing else to do. Can I ask a question? And then you tell us all about it. Everybody, please speak yes. out loud. <laughs> Eleanor, I seem to worry about everything. Many things. I don't care what it is. I just make it a habit of worrying, even about having faith. Could you tell me uh, how to work on this and uh, try to become more aware of this negativity? Well, that was one of my main problems. I mean, worry is you know, a great hobby of mine. Was. <laughs> and <laughs> I had to work on this so much. And the only thing that I can say is that you just have to keep seeing it in yourself. And trying as hard as you can to drop it each time. It'll keep recurring, but you have to just keep seeing it. And seeing how you're caught up in worry and in thought. And try to drop thought at that point. That's, you know, that's what you have to that's keep working on. It's very hard for me, too. <laughs> it's very difficult. Worry is a tremendous pleasure. Yes, that's good. <laughs> Say that again so no one misses it. Worry is a tremendous pleasure. Yes. And that's why we don't want to give it up. Who is it a pleasure to? Who is worry of right? Yeah. This this idea sure. we have about ourselves. Yeah. If I don't worry, I don't exist. Right? When I tell you I'm really worried, I am saying I exist as a worrier. So that my very worry becomes my false frame for myself. If I give up worry, I won't I won't be a worrier, right? Well, oh, that's tricky. But it's not easy to give it up. Oh, no, because no. Because, see, that, <coughs> that worry is, is one of those eyes. Worry it, is you. Yes. And, boy, that fights you. Yeah, like, right. Nobody's business. Like we like it. We like it. We, 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 uh, we have to observe that we, we don't want Well, to remember, we were raised with it. And it's not, you know, it's a part of our, our being. So we mm -hmm. have to right. fight it. Do you find that the easiest time to, to do this is, is after going to bed and, and not being sleepy and everything will whirl and whirl and whirl until you do drop it? I think you have to do it every moment you think about it. Not when you, yeah, not when you go to bed. I mean, it's a thing that you have to do every single moment that you think about it. Maybe you are more conscious at bedtime of your worry because you're lying there and there's no distractions of work or other people. So you simply become more aware that you are overtaken by it. 
But that very state, any state you see, negative state that you see at night, that's been haunting you all day long. It's just been pushed away by the man saying, I want to buy this from you and so on. You haven't noticed it. This is why in watch for very brief seconds throughout your day, and you have them all the time, walking down the hall at the office. You, you don't have to be in thought all the time. A good deal of time you do. But watch for split seconds when your mind can be free, when you're not driving the car and things like that, when you can simply stop this mad flood of negative thoughts and break it, drop it, just for a second there. You see? Watch for odd moments throughout the day when you can do that. Try to surprise yourself. That's important. Surprise yourself. Yes? Worried, and worried, and worried. And uh, when night came, I went to bed, and I thought, well, this just bugged me all day. And I put on one of the tapes and listened to that. Mr. Howard said, when you drop the how, there'll be no problem. And all day I had worried, how was I going to solve this problem? Just like that was gone. Yes. But I saw the how. Yeah. It was all thought. How am I going to do it? How is thought? Right, right, right. God does not need a technique for being healthy. He is healthy. Once you see it, I used to. Yeah, set up rules for myself. I wasn't going to worry, and I wasn't going to do this, and I wasn't going to do that. And until I found that the same person that was setting up the rules was the same person that was worrying. Right. And so now, if I want to worry, I just go ahead and worry until I get lost in it, until I really finally know that there's nothing I can do, which in, in essence is the same thing. Uh, I think one time you told me to sit there and shake, and uh, I did. And I apply that to almost everything. Yeah. It, uh, I find that I have less ego today than I did when I first picked up your book, but I, there was lots there. That I'm still trying to uh, resolve. Uh, for example, um, one of my favorite philosophies is letting it flow to terrorism. And uh, uh, this past week I was away and I did. It was beautiful because I had no outside interference, no job, no, uh, you know, the money was, everything was just fine and it was beautiful. This morning, I uh, last night before I went to bed, I had to set the alarm, I had to get up, and I found myself this morning racing around like a man. And I looked at my son, I thought, now I'm going to stop this. And immediately I thought, now just how do you expect to do that? You know, how do you expect, and I come up with no solution, you know. Now I have slowed down considerably since I observed it, and possibly before the day's over, I'll get back into kind of a, a normal swing. But I have, I don't know. All I know is that's the way I still am, and I've got lots of them. Uh, I don't have anything to do, frankly. Uh, if I would leave it alone, it'd probably be all yeah, right. All right, all right. <laughs> it's all right. We, we can use general terms. We know what we mean when we say we have a lot to do. I have to work on myself. You have to work on yourself. Because we are onto the idea of labels of I and you. But we now we can use them, because we're not deceiving ourselves about them. Yes. No, no. something different. Okay. What you're saying labels remind me. Um, I'm raising a, a little child, and it seems to me that education as we know it is a process of imparting labels. How? <laughs> but the child has a wonderful awareness of the wholeness and uh, fluidity of things before he learns any labels. Before he gets conditioned, you mean? Of course, of course. But, would uh, anybody like to comment on how you raise, you know, a child keeping as much as possible their nature or learning from them? Who will comment? Well, I, I think if I were raising a child today, I wouldn't send it to a school. Mm. I don't know what I would do, but I wouldn't send it to a school, I don't think. I don't know. I think it conditioned. There must be some other way. First, uh, I will work on myself real hard on all that. I will do that. Yeah. Yeah. Change, change myself. Then I will That's be able to. I will know what to do out there. As it is right now, I, I don't know what to do. But that's still the only thing. Still using the how. How am I going to do it? Drop the how. I'm going to straighten out. Do you understand something? We've gone over, it, but get it again, and this is this will apply. Somehow we have got the notion. 
that we can determine the growth, the direction of our children's lives, or the life of our husband and wife. Don't you know, now listen, don't you know you have no command over anyone at all? I'm sorry, it's as simple as this, and, and Juan just said it, but you have to come back to this, which means there's a lot of giving up to do. The only thing you can do is work on yourself to be a sane human being, to be a decent human being, so that you don't unconsciously pass on to that child or this other person in your life all the insanity that is given to him by everyone else. He's going to get it. Make no, You can't escape it. It's that bad. The prison is that bad. If you have done what you should do to make yourself right, that's where your responsibility begins and ends. If, by laws of accident, that child goes out and gets mixed up with the wrong people because he's out of your control, which he is, that is not your responsibility. And if you have guilt over it, you have made a wrong move. This is not cold. This is wisdom, and this is real love. A person who thinks that he can command and bring up his children rightly and all that is deluded. Notice the shame that good people get when their children go wrong. Yeah. Church people, how shocked and ashamed they are. This is self-righteous hypocrisy on their part. And they are chained human beings. And they're so shocked. We, we gave him everything. We brought him to Sunday school and church. This is the illusion that you can control and influence another person's life. Not only that, but what these parents were giving them were not the truth itself. They were passing on the delusions that their parents gave them. Very few people ever find the truth and can pass it on to others. When you see all this, I don't care what other human being it is, you are not responsible for them. On the everyday level, in bringing up your children, obviously you have certain responsibilities. But see the difference. You are responsible for taking care of them physically. You are responsible for seeing that they get <clears throat> the education that they need for common things like adding two and two and spelling cat. We, we don't have to go into that. You know that. You're responsible for giving them right food. You, you are mainly responsible for being a decent human being yourself. And once they pass from out under your control, when they're 18 or 20 or when they get married or whatever, that's the end of it. Don't you feel guilty about anything else. Even, look, some of you listening to this tape, you listen to this. If you have hurt your children badly, if you have hurt your husband badly, if you have hurt your wife badly because you were asleep, which you probably did, because you didn't know how to behave, because you were afraid, right? You behave badly because you're afraid, because you don't know what to do. If you have done all this and have got to the point of desperation where you don't want to go along with it anymore, and you start to work on yourself and you understand all these things we're talking about, but the minute you understand you are forever free from this. This is what real forgiveness consists of. You have to forgive yourself first, which takes a tremendous honesty to make sure you're not lying. When you have died to yourself, then there is no more connection with anything evil you might have done. But I will, I will warn you very seriously, you must not deceive yourself about what this means. Because if you go out and repeat that behavior, then you have not seen it. You have deceived yourself into thinking this so-called repentance and guilt is falsehood. To really repent means that you have died to your egotism of thinking that you do exist as a separate self. Then you are free. Then you will never be vicious again. You will never be cruel again. You will not ruin anyone else's life as you ruin both yours and your children's life. I'm telling you that no matter how badly you have behaved, how evil you have been, and you have been, you can be free of it right now if you get on to what we're talking about. And this is the only way. Don't deceive yourself. Don't try any other way. Then, because you are truly a changed human being, you won't be evil and vicious and cruel again. And you won't exploit other people as you used to do. How's our time? we got about another three minutes. Comment? We have a couple minutes before we have a break. Watch self-deception at every second. Yeah, it's uh, very, very painful, but you got to see it. Like, uh, I became aware that uh, 
I was very greedy. You know, that was painful. I, I was supposed to be greedy, you know. I'm already studying this thing, you know. So I began to see it on simple things like food. We said the way I was conditioned a long time ago. I better take my part first, the biggest part, you know. If I was a kid. Right. Right. And it was very painful. And here I am, Bob, studying this thing. You have to see him, don't, like he's, uh, Mr. Howard said, don't feel guilty or try to be good. It's another, it's another trap. Let's see it. And admit it. All, all mistakes are mechanical behavior instead of conscious behavior. When I become conscious of my mechanical mistakes, really conscious, I begin to end them because I catch them before they happen because now a simple consciousness of myself has replaced the running of a mechanical mind which is always wandering off somewhere and getting me into trouble. This is why maybe I dropped that cup of tea because I was picking up the tea and I was thinking about that person. Our time is up. We'll continue afterward. We've talked a lot about being aware and conscious when we go out from here in our work or at home. I'd like you to do this. Right now, at this moment, you are in a highly positive, if I can use that word without having its opposite of negative, a truly positive atmosphere. We're telling the truth here. We're telling the facts. So you feel good. You do, and this is all right. This is fine because there's this is what it is. The truth, and the truth does make you feel good rightly. Be conscious of this. When you go out into your families, your work or whatever it may be, try to be conscious, aware that maybe you have been taken over by the negative atmosphere. Simply see this. Now, don't you permit it to happen. You know what, know what I mean by this. You have another way to live, which is detached from all these negative comments, all these sour looks on the faces. You know what I'm talking about. Don't you let yourself be taken over by this. You remember this other state that you have, that you've caught a glimpse of. Because this is the way you can live. And don't you let yourself be taken over. Because if you're careless, you will. We've discussed before how easy it is to watch that television set and identify with something and get depressed or worried. Or someone makes a remark in the family about financial conditions or about health or about whatever. You watch and see whether that has taken you over, and then you absolutely refuse. And the refusal consists of simply seeing that you don't have to be taken over. This will grow as you go along. What I'm trying to say is, right now you're fine. You're not in a negative atmosphere right now. You watch how the social atmosphere tries to take you over. And don't you dare let anyone or anything take you over. You be your own atmosphere, which you can be, the right atmosphere. Now, may I ask Bob to make a comment of any kind? <coughs> yes. Well, as you say, we are in a uh, in a in a state of uh, I hate to use the word elation because elation always has its opposite. But uh, the thing to do when we leave is to keep working. Now, this is where I let down because. As soon as I go home, uh, I will sort of forget, and then other little activities come up, and forget again. This is why I especially like those words, drop it. And I think I used that a hundred times since our session yesterday, at least a hundred times, and I find, found that it had a, a marked influence on breaking some negativities that I suddenly recognized that I didn't realize were negativities before. Right. But when I could drop it in, I had to speak sharply to myself on occasion because I was enjoying those right. little movies. Right, or, right, right. And, and this is the, the big thing, is to take from here and to apply there. Right. Bob made it one extra good point. Let me bring it out just a little, then we'll go on. He said that he had this, in his own words, to speak sternly to this state. You get emotional over this. You get emotional. You rise up. I've told you this. 
You rise up in rebellion against this. Not against society, not against politics. You know better than that. You rise up in rebellion against your own illusions, against your own mental movies. <clears throat> Get some feeling into this. This will help you. This is right feeling. This is right emotion. Sally, make a comment, please. All right. I find that one of my, the worries I have is one over sickness, being unhealthy. I find that this is what takes me away, the thought of being ill. Physically. Physically, Ill. uh-huh. Having some terrible disease, and I notice that this particular thought, I see it in my mind <clears throat> quite a lot. I may see someone who's ill and reflect it back in myself. I mean, thing, self-reference, as you mentioned earlier. And I find that this is one of the things that takes me away from myself, is the dread, the fear of being sick. Very good. I think you were going to say something, were you? Uh, no, uh, what she says is really true. That's a, a very uh, powerful thing that she talked about. Yeah. But what I was going to say is about going back into the negativity. I find that is one of the hardest things to overcome. That when we what we were talking about before, but um, what Sally said about that, I think it, I think if everyone were truthful, who really didn't really find themselves, they would all have the same reaction to that. Associative thinking. Yes. You see someone, and you say that will be me someday, something like that. And that's a very good point. You you watch these things, you watch them, and you'll see how easily, how quickly you are taken over by a sight of something out there, the mere sight. You see the sight, what? You see an accident, whatever it might be, and there goes the dread, and there goes the emotions. This means that we're living on the mechanical level. It is quite possible to see anything or to be in any condition, not physically. If you're physically hurt, of course, that's another matter. You've got pain or something. I'm talking about a psychological condition where you are untouched absolutely by what's out there. Where the I'll put it this way, just to exaggerate it. As I said yesterday, the whole world could be threatening you. And because you are free, it is as if it doesn't exist out there. And it doesn't. Because reality, reality, truth cannot be threatened by anything. It's nothing. You shrug it off. In, in fact, you don't even bother to shrug it off. Even that would be a waste of energy. It's nothing. There's nothing to shrug off. At first you think the lions are there. Then you fight the lions. Then you get a little bit more understanding. And you see that the lions were created by you. Pretty soon, the lions are not even out there growling to fight anymore. Because the lions first existed here. You no longer create them. They don't, they, the ghosts don't appear anymore. How can they? Because you're not creating them anymore. Who will come? Well, we'll go back to what Sally said. Uh, about sickness, illness. When you see that. And I'm trying to bring this up, what Mr. Howard said uh, a few days ago to us. The anger we have of dying, that we have anger, that one of the days we're going to die, we have to, that we don't accept, we don't want to accept nothing. We want things to go and go and go our, on our way. And if we see uh, illness and, well, that's going to be one of the, it's going to be me one of those days. So then that means that you have a fear of death. Basically, if you are afraid of being ill or getting ill, that means that you have a fear of death, and that means that you aren't doing your work because you're not dying at the, to the, at the moment, to the moment. Exactly. But the, if we see this, we know that we have it. If I see these thoughts, my heart may beat a little faster and I get worried. And if I see that, this is the beginning of the end. The beginning of dying. This is the beginning of dying to see that you have it. At one time, I wouldn't have noticed this. I would have completely <laughs> disregarded right. it, avoided it at all costs. Repress it. Yeah. Right, That's repress right. it, push it down. But the beginning of seeing it, that you have these dreadful fears, is the first step in, in uh, dying to them. Life is a thought. Death is a thought. Their, their thoughts. We identify with one side. See the opposites? Life, death. See, we're trying to live above the opposites. We didn't identify with life. 
Would there be a death meaningful? Would it be something to fear, you see? We cling to life. My life, my successes, my physical handsomeness, physical beauty, and that's all going to pass away. And Mulan said, we resent death because it's going to steal me. Where there's no me, how can there be resentment? A lot of work, hmm? So we repeat that we have a lot of work to do? The, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't follow that. If we think we see someone that fell or look at the disease, is that not an illusion if we can see through it? On the physical level, it is not an illusion if you have something physically wrong with you. That is not illusion. That is a fact. Because on that level, look, this is, look, <laughs> on a certain level, there's a tree out there that is eight years old. It's bearing peaches, right? Now, this operates under certain natural laws. The tree is born, and the tree grows 20 years older, and it dies. When it begins to die, it may have certain things wrong with it. The physical tree begins to wear out and fall apart. We live under certain natural laws. Under certain natural laws, we don't say that your eyesight is as good as it was when you were 20 years old, if you're now 70 years old, because it isn't. But where's the problem? The problem is you were saying I should have the eyesight I had when I was 20. Are you trying to tell nature what to do? Are you trying to tell God how to treat you? Don't you see? You don't see it at all. You don't see that when your eyesight begins to fade, and when the wrinkles appear, huh? when they begin to appear, that this is God himself operating, and you are one with it. Why do you make an opposite to growing old? Why do you cling to one side and say, I shouldn't grow old? The acceptance of all this is simply acceptance of the whole capsule way of living, of the way life is as a whole. Why do you resist anything at all? Now, we mustn't get into a wrong way of thinking about something physically wrong. Things can be physically wrong. We we mustn't get into deceiving ourselves that it isn't wrong. When a tree starts to die, you don't say that tree is is the way it was when it was a a five-year-old tree. Why do you say the same with yourself? On a physical level, it begins to fade away. God has ceased to express himself as you, as me, as this man, as this lady, after a certain period of time. But God, truth, reality remains. Are you apart from truth, from God, from reality? If you think you are apart, you're going to be afraid of your eyesight getting dim, and of eventual death. It is your will that you die. It is your will that your eyesight grows dimmer after a while. Why do you put an opposite to what is happening to you? It's just as much your will as it is God's will, because there's no such thing as two wills. There is one thing. You yourself are playing a part in growing old. You yourself are God growing old. Right? Where's the opposite to that? You, you you think think a little bit. Why do you fight anything? Why do you resist evil? When you are one with yourself, anything that happens to you is happening to the total universe. It's do, doing it anyway, but the thought is dividing you. It's happening to the entire universe. Not to you. Who are you? A label? Comment? Yeah, that's it. Uh, I have separated myself. Separate. I want to be different than everybody else. Universe or whatever, other people or anything. And I suffer. Because I don't want want to accept reality. Reality is what I am right now. I'm all... A mugly or whatever you want. But when I write to tell this one, uh, maybe I'm jealous about her because she's younger she's than She's younger? Me. Right? Now we're too. Thank you, Have any of you ever observed that in yourself? On younger people? Comparison. 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 Right? right? Well, yes, in comparison with age and comparison with many, many things. And mm-hmm. I think that we have a tendency 
to identify with so many of the um, things that society puts out that you, you could become younger, you could become uh, healthier if you do this or that or the other thing, you know. Right. And you get, yes, yeah. right? And you, you know, you start to uh, get caught between two things there, you know, right. truth and falsehood. Do you see that there's nothing to do except to understand? If you understand, there is nothing to do but to live as you live. And there's no opposition to that, financially even. Or we're real practical here. So you don't have, you have just enough money to keep yourself from starving. Fine, what's your problem? No problem. The problem is the I, <coughs> that I should have it as good as you did. How come you got all the breaks financially and you're better looking than I am? Or you're more slender than I am? Or you have the degree, college degrees and the prestige that I don't have? Opposite. Who will make a comment who has said very little so far? Has anyone here said very little? Who would like to? Who might like to? No one answered. Did you have any in particular? Maybe you didn't. I don't know. When no one spoke up, did you have any particular feeling where you may be a little embarrassed or hope that someone would speak up or wondering whether the man was referring to you and wanted you to talk up? Anything like that at all? Okay. Okay. Hello, Ben. Did you see it? <laughs> hey. Hey, something I wanted to say and I thought I ought to do it. Would you say that again, please? I'm sorry. I really. Didn't. Yes. And I thought, well, certainly if I take the time and the effort, I'll find out my own answer. I should be more intelligent than the things that people see. Uh, my ego is You know. Uh. But I, I do want to bring it up, even if it's kind of the same question. Bring it up. Uh, yesterday was a weird day, uh, insofar as, uh, my past, uh, not in just one area, but Zoom. Uh, I had a call from somebody that owed me a good deal of money, prepared to pay me back. The one time that it caused me a lot of anxiety, and I had to release it, drop it, and here's the money coming, you see. Uh, I had a call, even so far back as 25 years ago, from a girl I graduated with, long distance, at 11 o'clock last night, discussing old times of graduation and reunion. And I, at first, I wanted to get upset. And then I thought, well, what's it, uh, why am I getting, I don't even know why I'm upset, why, why? This is the thing I, uh, the thing I went to sleep on last night. What's this all about? Why in one day should uh, four or five different little segments of the past hit me? Boom. Nothing, uh, you know, uh, my reaction to them at first was kind of uh, eerie uh, in that uh, I thought, this, there's an omen here. There's something that I should, uh, mm. you know. <laughs> don't don't get mystical. I don't. Uh, yeah, you're probably. Don't don't go into imagination and all that. Say, Sally, will you answer the following question, which will connect with this? Why must we, this lady and the rest of us, cease to love agitations like this? You're. Well, we love agitation because it gives us a sense of who we are. And we don't want to give this up because we love to be comfortable. And this gives us a feeling of security. When you're agitated, you have successfully hidden from yourself for a little bit. Therefore, you don't have to face a lot of things that you must face. For example, that we have a lot of self-deceptions. When I'm watching the parade go down the street and there are clowns and there are acrobats and there's the band, I don't exist at all to my, isn't it wonderful? I'm a thousand percent distracted. Great. But way back here somewhere, I'm afraid when that parade is going to come to an end. This is what all these little agitations do for us. They keep us so distracted from everything that we fear to face that we love them. We have to stop loving them and when you do, they will fade away from themselves because where on earth is the agitation? I don't care who's on the end of that phone. I don't care what comes in the mail or what someone says to you. The agitation is right there and nowhere else. 
Don't you know that you are free from all agitation? All of it? Why do you let that thought take you over about what happened yesterday or ten years ago? Why is this still in command of you? Because it allows you to escape from yourself for a little bit. And what we're trying to do is to cut off all escapes. And agitation is one of them. Blabbing to other people about our problems is another. Blabbing to ourselves about our problems is another. So much we have to dare to give up. We, she, oh, sorry. Go ahead. we actually create our agitation. I've noticed that um, if I have, say, going to work in the morning, I leave myself so much time and it's too little, so I create the agitation before going to work. And this must be pleasurable to me, otherwise I wouldn't do it. But I've noticed that. It's, uh, we create our agitation. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir, my spelling. Uh, could you uh, possibly go to work a little earlier than you used to, say, take another 10 or 15 minutes? Would that create uh, something in you that uh, you might see it better? Well, I have done that one. Because I, I uh, used to be much, I used to be late, but now I'm on time. I have done that. I've worked on this problem, but I'm still working on it. And I could go half an hour, see earlier, and sit. That's what you mean to give me this shot? Well, I mean, if you see something there, yeah. Yes, uh-huh, mm -hmm. yes. If you I'm, see that it would do uh, something good for you. Mm -hmm. this one right, that? yes, I've been working on this one. Mm -hmm. And I see that I create the agitation. Make things hard on yourself. Don't make them easy. You understand what that means? Make them hard. I'll give you an example. This does connect to this. You, you see the connection for yourself. Suppose you have a task you don't like. Shall we take dishwashing? You have a sink full of dishes and everybody else is having fun. and You're stuck with the dishes. And you're working on yourself. You'd be wide awake and you say to yourself, I am not going to be the slave of these dishes. And so, wide awake, no resentment, but living one with yourself, you say, my usual way of behaving when I resent something is to do it real fast, get it over with, pretend I don't see that greasy pan over on the stove, and I'll get everything done, then I can comb my hair a little bit and wash my hands and, and put perfume on <laughs> and go out and join the rest of the people and have the fun that they're having. No, no. You say, I am going to slow down, and I'm going to be aware of my hand reaching for the soap to put into the soap dish, and I'm going to deliberately look for more dishes that have been hidden underneath there that, that I didn't see yesterday because I resented it, and I'm going to get them out very slowly and consciously. I'm going to do every dishes, every dish. I'm not going to let a spot remain on that pan. I'm going to get it, even if it's going to take me an extra ten minutes. I'm going to get that one spot. You watch the resistance in you against doing this. And you make it hard on yourself by saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get everything spotless. I'm going to even sweep the floor a little bit, which is not a part of the usual task of doing this. I'm going to get that up. And and when I see that there's only five minutes left of the party over, I don't give two cents about that. I am going to get myself free by facing this horrible monster called a dish full of dirty dishes. And I'm going to wake up. You understand the point? Make it hard on yourself. Don't give way. Don't compromise. And when you walk into that room, look! Oh boy! When you come in here, the people have gone and there's twice a big a mess as there was. You thought you had it made. Now you've really got a shock because they left twice as many dishes for you to do. Start all over. And you watch how much resentment. You, you thought you were being spiritual. You thought you'd gain something, didn't you? You thought, I'm really good now. I've got what that man is talking about. You watch yourself when you come in and, and they left bur a burned couch as well. In the first place, you shouldn't have given that party. <laughs> Why did you give that party in the first place? You're lonely. You want people around you. And you want you serve the drink so that they'll uh, like you. Gee, he's a generous man, a generous person, whatever it was. Don't give parties. You know what I'm talking about. 
just gonna do this. We think we owe something to others. Yeah. If somebody gives me a party or something, at least I have to return the favor that we owe oh, and be annoying. Make it real hard on yourself. Don't make it easy. Don't compromise. A big shock would be not to do something when you think you owe it to somebody. And your first reaction yes. would be to go ahead and reciprocate. But this would be a great shock to you if you would just say, I'm not going to do it this time and bear the pain of that. Right. The guilt? The guilt. But now you're going to see it. And then you ask yourself, why did I feel guilty? And we've talked about that enough. But you know that that's a false reaction. And you're... You understand, I'm sure, that when you start behaving in a different way toward other people, that they are going to wonder about it, and you may have a little anxiety that they're going to wonder at your changed behavior. Aren't they? Because you're not gratifying their vanity as you used to do. You're not trading with them anymore. And if you're in a situation, in a family situation, or a social situation, whatever it is, you'd be very wise about applying all this. In the first place, rule one, keep your mouth shut. You work silently. Don't go around telling people about these things. They're going to distort it. They don't want it. You keep your mouth shut. And you work silently. And don't make the mistake of having a mechanical application of this toward other people. For example, you, you, you have, you're never allowed to be rude toward anyone. You be very tactful toward people in, when you start to change toward them. You, we are never allowed to be negative, obviously, toward anyone. Very often a, a false little imp will rise up and tell you that you are being now being dynamically spiritual and you're just being as much of an idiot as you were before. So we have to be very, very careful. But then after a while, after a while, it becomes very easy because there's no longer any decision to make, whatever. There is no decision to make. Reality with a capital R is one thing and has no division in itself. Therefore, it has no choices to make about behavior, except on the everyday level. I choose tea instead of coffee. And that's all there is to it. Then, as was said before, you brought up, you don't get involved in wrong social situations again because you know better. You don't throw parties just so people will like you just because you're lonely. And you don't go places just because you're lonely. And, you, and then, then, wherever you're with people, you are behaving perfectly regardless of how they behave. But still, in many, many cases, you won't be where you used to go before. There's nothing for you anymore. We'll take ten more minutes. Uh, one, uh, one good thing that uh, the work project that uh, I know it has helped me, and I think it will help some of you, is when I get up in the morning, just where most of the problems start, we, we, we're the one that start and we cause it. So I say, let whatever wants to happen go ahead and happen. And then a thought will come in, well, this thing's probably happened. Something that I don't like. So like Mr. Howard said, well, I will it. I hope it does happen. I'll accept anything that life brings to me. Okay. Whether good or bad or whatever. And at first, it didn't work. <laughs> that way. But uh, as I continue working with that, I see that the resistance goes down. And accept things as they are. As long as I'm trying to tell things or command things to turn out as right. some certain way, then I'm going to be hurt. Right. I let whatever the day wants to throw at me. And this is hard because we don't want that. But if we start with that, we'll see that, uh, that it works. Resistance goes down and you feel better and everything. And you say, well, look, uh, Two months ago, I resisted this thing, but then there's no one there to fight. There's no ego to fight, right? All fighting, all demanding, all insisting is done by this false man inside of us. As he begins to go away, who's there to argue? Who's there to fight? 
which is real strength, which most people will not understand as strength, because they take as strength fighting, arguing. Well, you've got to stand up for your rights or people will walk all over you. A man with that attitude is walked all over by everyone all day long, starting with himself. You know, it's amazing how you think you don't need. You go out and see so many things and you have no heat of them. You don't want to get much lighter. Start very close to home on all your work. Right here. Don't get way off and ask questions which have no meaning at all. Like, how can I change other people? See, that's 50 miles away. Start right here. How can I change myself? How can I work on my own attitudes toward myself and toward others, which, by the way, will always be the same. If you dislike others, you will dislike yourself because it's all one thought. It's just one thought there dividing itself into apparent, apparent opposites, really. That the, the self-dislike, self-dislike and other dislike. It's all the same. This is why, this is why as we get healthier and self-dislike goes away, See that, see the egotism and self dislike? I'm a terrible person. People love to brag how bad they are. As that goes away, then dislike of other people go away because you no longer believe in them as separate selves either. In the physical body, a person might behave quite badly. He might be quite cruel, but there's no projection on your part. You're free of him. You're free of his mechanical cruelty <coughs> because you're free of your own mechanical cruelty. Start right here. Not way off there. Don't don't wonder about things. Don't ask way off questions. Always come right back. How can I work on myself? That's the, the beginning and the end, right? That'll be enough.